Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I can see that a number of you are logging on at the moment. So welcome to RDA's fourth webinar for 2024. And um, I'm really delighted today to be joined by Debbie Venn, who is a partner at DMH Stallard, and Amelia Woodley, who is the ESG Director for Speedy Hire PLC. I've worked with both Amelia and Debbie um, for a number of years, both of them in different places. Um, and I know that you are going to really um, benefit from their exp extensive experience today. I will allow Amelia and Debbie to introduce themselves more formally when I hand over to them. So I can see that a number of you are still joining. We'll just give um, people a few more minutes. I think you know that today we are considering practical steps on how to address modern slavery and forced labor in supply chains. And I think you're in for a treat because we're going to be looking at the subject from both a um, contractual, legal, um, business point of view, also from a best practice stance and, and some really practical steps. How do we put into practice what it is that um, we need to do as businesses to address the risk of modern slavery in our supply chains. Whilst people are still joining, a few housekeeping notes. We will be <clears throat> answering questions. If you put them in the question and answer um, box or in the chat, please, we'll aim to answer as many questions as we can during the session. So please do listen and ask us questions. We like um, that to happen. Um, we also will be recording this session, so um, you will be able to listen to another recording once this is completed. And um, I believe Amelia and Debbie are also happy to share slides afterwards, so do ping us an email if that's what you'd like to do. So I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully this all works fine. There we go. Um, uh, just can you see my screen? Maybe you all see it. Good. All right. <clears throat> so just a, a little bit actually about um, myself and about RDA International. So um, I'm a tri-qualified lawyer. I set up RDA International 16 years ago and um, have worked on human rights and sustainability issues for quite a long period of time. I think that probably gives away a little bit about my experience, I'll say, instead of my age. Um, RDA International are specialists in sustainability and business and human rights. But we have a really particular expertise around addressing forced labor and modern slavery. And we um, really work with organizations to help them to understand what the law requires of them, but how do they put that law into practice? And we've worked across many sectors. These are just a snapshot of some of the organizations. I think that sort of diversity um, across different sectors gives us the opportunity to really add value to what um, is required around some of the, the very difficult challenges for companies around this complex issue of modern slavery and forced labor in both business operations and supply chains. Now, Today is really about the why and the how, and I'm not going to spend long speaking to you all, but just a few things, I think, from my own experience of working across um, different sectors and companies uh, in relation to modern slavery, just a few ideas of what you can do practically to address modern slavery as an issue. I probably don't need to emphasize that um, this modern slavery as a risk is um, very it's very clearly evident um, based on the numbers. We know that there are 50 million recorded people in slavery today across the world, but we also know that numbers are hidden and it's not always possible to find out whether somebody is in modern slavery or in forced labor exploitation in your supply chain. And I think that what we what we have to think about before we think about the law is what are the reasons that businesses are having to consider this. So it is a legal reason, and we'll look at that in a second, but it is also about investors asking more questions, being interested in understanding how organizations are going to address this as an issue. And I would say that 
one of the things I, I found particularly interesting um, in a podcast conversation I had recently with um, Jessica uh, Wan, who works with an investment company, was that they are looking not only at whether or not they, they a company or large company has a human rights or a sustainability specialist or ESG director like Amelia, but how big is the team? How are they actually managing to implement this? Because there's a recognition that just a policy and perhaps one person may not be enough for the type of challenges that are facing organizations now and addressing things like forced labor, modern slavery, human rights. So investors are asking questions. Banks are not lending at the same rates if you can't demonstrate that you have appropriate ESG credentials. And of course, addressing your risk, whether that's modern slavery, whether it's forced labor, other human rights issues, is part of demonstrating that you have an understanding of the challenges in your organization. Customers are driving change and driving standards. Many of them are asking suppliers to ensure that they can demonstrate that they can meet the standards that many of the customers have to address from the law, particularly when we look at um, the legislation in Europe like um, CS3D, CSRD, and the standards that are being set for the very large companies. I also think one needs to take into account public procurement. So public procurement requirements around tenders and demonstrating what you have in place is pretty key. In respect of legislation, the one thing I would like to um, just uh, perhaps share with you all today is that whilst we're looking at the UK Modern Slavery Act, there are many other jurisdictions that now also require reporting on modern slavery issues. And what this really means for global organizations is for them to a get an understanding of what jurisdictions they operate in and which jurisdictions require excuse me reporting be amazed how many organizations we've dealt with which haven't considered the um, particular jurisdictions um, reporting requirements and having to scramble at the last minute to get a statement together it also poses challenges on how you might uh, report in a unified manner when you have differing requirements from the different laws. And, and, and that again also becomes a, a challenge internally on how you pull together the different information requirements, the data points, the information, the processes, the policies to be able to do effective reporting. And we're going to talk about that, or we can talk about that later in the question and answer session. But I think that, you know, when you look at the growth in this legislation and the growth in the laws as um, they've developed in the last 12 years, you can see just from the slide you, the the um, the types of laws that are covering either human rights or modern slavery, forced labor, or both in human rights and the environment. And I think critically, what we are seeing is this absolute emphasis on due diligence and risk management. So I said to you, we, I'd mentioned, I think four, four or five steps, key steps that you can think about in, in how to address modern slavery from a practical point of view. So the first step is understanding which laws apply and what is required of you. The second point is understanding how the business approaches addressing modern slavery risk, both at an organizational level and within its supply chain. And really the most effective way, I think, for an organization to establish what they have in place and what their gaps are is to undertake a gap analysis and to really dig deep into understanding what is there, what is missing, and to um, and then as part of that process, and I think um, Amelia might allude to this because we did work with Speedy around the modern slavery gap analysis for them as a business, using the gaps, using the benchmark to prioritize action and to develop a roadmap. The next step I would suggest is to really look at how you're going to identify and assess your adverse impacts. Now, I've put this in the context of the OECD and the due diligence requirements under OECD because I think another critical factor when you're thinking about how to address modern slavery from a practical point of view 
is to consider how it sits and how it's managed across the broader due diligence requirements set by the UNGPs, set by the OECD. And I think as companies, many companies are addressing modern slavery as just one aspect of perhaps that due diligence piece. And, and it's helpful to think of it more broadly. So start with modern slavery, but think about how it's built into your human rights and business um, processes in your human rights and, and um, due diligence um, um, framework so that it doesn't become a bolt on, it becomes integrated into the business. And as part of identifying and, ad and assessing your impact, there should be some kind of mapping of your supply chain. And different companies will take different approaches to this. You may have data points, you may have, um, you, you know, you may have um, a set of questions that go to suppliers asking for more information from other suppliers, but you may just actually do a mapping exercise to give you that visibility on where you operate, who your suppliers are, and from there you can start digging down into a more detailed heat map or a more detailed understanding of the areas where there might be greater risk. The This is the third step, fourth step, um, to consider is actually having in place an effective due diligence framework. So Section 54 of the Modern Slavery Act requires businesses to provide information on its due diligence processes. What that really means is actually having an oversight of what you have in place. What, what have you set out in terms of your governance structures? What are your policies? What do your contracts look like? I know Debbie's going to talk about that. How about your supplier codes of conduct? Have you trained everybody? When you've identified and assessed an impact, how are you going to remedy that? What are your grievance mechanisms? What, do that, what does that look like? So there's a whole array of things that you have to consider to ensure that you have an effective due diligence framework, which has to be continuous. So it means it needs to be dynamic, need to consider as a business how you uh, are going to uh, um, contain where you and in what format you're going to contain that process and how you're going to keep building on it year on year because that will underpin your your um the, the business ability to mitigate risk and to establish itself as being more resilient and um, sustainable um, as part of due diligence as well, one of the things I would suggest is that really pinpointing questions that you want to ask of your suppliers and getting evidence from them to underpin their answers so that you can start um, assessing whether they are high risk or low risk or medium risk. And so what you'll see um, on the slide is, um, a, is Tabara. So Tabara is our new, Audia's new online supply chain due diligence platform. And it um, allows organizations to send questions to suppliers. And as a result of the evidence that comes back, it will set suppliers into high, medium or low risk buckets. And from there, um, we would look at some continuous improvement questions, some corrective action. And then um, when you look at high risk suppliers, deciding whether you need to audit. So I'm making that distinction between questions and assessment and audit. because I think it's really important as part of establishing due diligence and, um, and uh, looking at forced labor and, and modern slavery is to understand that audit only plays one part of it. I'm not saying audit isn't necessary, it is necessary, but it should be part of a broader due diligence cycle. And that means working closely with procurement to really get those kind of processes in place. And the final points that I want to raise before I'm going to hand over to um, Debbie is that really, the, the next step is how do you establish that you have an effective um, procedure in place? Because you need to be able to, again, under the law, whether it's a due diligence law, whether it's Section 54 of the Modern Slavery Act, establish effective monitoring and auditing systems. So that is key, how you set that up, how do you develop remedy, but also how do you build transparent and cooperative relationships with your suppliers? How do you capacity build? 
those are critical elements. And as companies mature in the space, we'll start seeing them taking better and informed action around um, actually supporting their suppliers, building those relationships, doing the capacity building and the working together. So I'm going to stop with that now, and I'm going to um, hand over to Debbie. I hope that um, what I've just shared with you is a good introduction to what's coming from Debbie and Amelia. Just five practical steps that you can think about. And, and the last thing to say, actually, it sounds really easy saying five steps. It sounds quite glib. Get on with it. It's not so difficult. It is difficult, and it takes time. And the journey that for companies embarking on this is typically 12 months to three years. So for those of you listening that haven't started this journey, the, the key thing is to get started. Don't get left behind. Don't become a laggard. Um, but recognize it takes time. It requires resource. It requires patience. So I'll stop right there. And Debbie, if I can hand over to you, please. Um, thank you. No problem. Thank you, Colleen. Um, and um, as Colleen mentioned, so I'm Debbie Venn, a partner at DMH Stallard. Um, my background is uh, um, mainly from the sort of the commercial contracts side of things. So we look at supply chain contracts, both from a customer perspective and from a supply perspective. So either end of the supply chain. Um, so, you know, whether you're a supplier yourself or whether you're the customer receiving um, certain supplied goods or services, um, we, we're aware of the different issues at either end. And, um, and I think from the point of view of where we're concentrating our time today, what I'm really focusing on is three different stages. So the first um, being the um, due diligence stage is sort of the pre-contractual stage. Then what needs to go in that contract for that contract stage to, to be correct? And then the managing of the relationship once that contract's been signed and, and how you go from there. Um, so if I go to the um, next slide, Francesca, please, thanks. So um, what are the key issues then that we're looking at? So Colleen's already mentioned from the point of view of when you're looking at your supply chain issues, um, what are the pre-contractual issues, the due diligence that you would need to undertake um, when you're looking at suppliers or what, if you're a supplier yourself, due diligence questions can you expect from a customer? And this might be built into an existing pre-contractual checks stage or checklist, um, but given the modern slavery issues um, that are required to be looked at under the due diligence section that Colleen's already mentioned under the Modern Slavery Act, this needs to be forming part of that if it, um, if it doesn't already or having its own separate um, checks in place. The other key things when looking at the contractual stage is what are the contractual risks? You know, what are actually, what is the supply that's going in? Ahead. Is it manufacture of goods? Is it supply of services? Where is that being undertaken? Is it in the same territory as you? Is it in a different territory? The risk will vary depending on the answers to those questions, and we'll unpick that in just a moment. Um, but when you are sub subcontracting, or whether you're the supplier and um, you might want to use a sub subcontractor, the contract terms that you need to be checking is whether there's any restrictions on that appointment of a subcontractor because then obviously that affects the chain even further if it, it does need to go down to a subcontractor stage. Um, we also need to consider as part of that um, contractual stage termination rights. So is there a specific right to terminate when it comes to non-compliance with modern slavery issues? So we'll touch on each of these, but I think what I wanted to do first of all on the next slide, um, please Francesca, um, is just look at the um, contractual sort of pre-contractual issues so these are some of the things that I would expect to see as part of a general due diligence process um, and making sure that um, these things are being considered as part of your um, your pre-contractual questions so firstly a lot of the um, contractual risk will depend on whose terms of the contract will be applying so you know is the contract going to be on the customer's terms. So for example, will the supplier be contracting on terms that have been presented as part of a RFP or an ITT or procurement process? Procurement is most likely because you'll be presented with a contract and that's generally what you have to comply with. So it might be that they're on the customer terms, in which case they'll generally be more customer friendly. But if you're a large supplier or you're being um, supplied with services or goods from a large supplier, the supplier will generally have their own supply terms which would also tend to be more supplier friendly. 
Now, um, generally those terms and conditions will have provisions in there relating to liability, termination, but they might not specifically deal with modern slavery or forced labor issues. And so those are the sorts of things that we need to be checking as part of that pre-contractual checklist to make sure that it is an issue that's addressed within the terms and conditions, both from a compliance perspective and how that's then managed in the contract. Now, it might be that you've got no terms and conditions, um, in which case, you know, um, the, the difficulty, but that is obviously there's nothing in writing. You might have some exchange of emails, but these types of risks wouldn't necessarily be covered off. And so you're relying then on the general legislation in terms of roles, responsibilities and what the position would be, which is not ideal. So it's best to have something in, in writing if you can um, to try and manage that. Now, in addition to the contract terms themselves, Pauline's already mentioned, you might have, for example, a um, supply code of conduct. Now, if you are a large um, business and you um, ask suppliers to comply with this supplier code of conduct, it would generally include provisions relating to compliance with applicable laws, but it often and um, will most likely have provisions relating to compliance with modern slavery, bribery, protection, all of those sorts of um, good things. So uh, normally what happens is there is a a policy on um, on slavery built within these types of code of conduct so that as a supplier um uh, you are making sure that you are getting um uh, your suppliers to comply with those um your your position on modern slavery so um then as a, as part of that supplier code of conduct um and any of those relevant policies as i say some of these things might be governed um in different ways depending on where goods are manufactured or services are supplied and if you are managing different territories as part of that you might have third parties who you appoint as your representative to undertake various checks on those suppliers in different countries because they will be aware of um, any issues specific to that particular territory they will be able to um, make sure that um, from the purposes of forced labor or other modern slavery legislation in different countries that there is a level of compliance and that your supplier is, is complying with their code of conduct like that. So um, how that's governed will depend on where things are being supplied from, but it's part of that checklist and that due diligence process to, to get the grips with pre-contract. So in terms of um, the checklist that you run through with the suppliers, um, obviously you'd like to, you want to understand their general procedures, but one of the things that we often ask um, um, for large customers, we ask suppliers to do is to actually provide some form of references. So have they, as a supplier, um, undertaken similar types of processes for um, modern slavery or forced labour compliance for other customers? And are there customers that we can ask um, these questions of who could give a reference as to the supplier's compliance? So these are all things that can be done pre-contract as part of that due diligence process on, on suppliers. And if you are a supplier yourself, these are the sorts of things that you might get asked um, uh, by a customer. Um, then next um, slide, looking at the contractual terms themselves, what, what would we be looking at in order to make sure that the contractual compliance side of things could be covered? So generally within a contract, you will have a contract management provision, which will confirm who, who is appointed, for example, as the representative or the contract manager for that contract. So who's responsible? And you would normally have at least one at the customer, one at the supplier potentially different layers depend or different roles and responsibilities depending on the type of um, goods being manufactured or, or, or provided or, or supply, uh, services being provided. But for the good overall management of a contract, you would normally have people responsible at either end of the chain to make sure that discussions can take place if there's an issue um, and, um, and the contract can be um, managed effectively. That could include, for example, an escalation process in the event of there being a problem. Um, sometimes contracts don't include a specific escalation process. They might just have a dispute resolution process. But before it gets to the point of being a dispute, you might want to just raise issues and escalate them internally to um, discuss at a, a sort of a contract manager level before it gets escalated any further. And it's good to have that type of escalation process built into the contract so that you know how that would be managed on a practical level. Now, as a customer, um, you would also potentially want to review um, the performance of the supplier. So as Colleen was mentioning, the sort of the auditing side of things, actually hardwiring that audit or review process into the contract itself. So you have an idea of 
how frequently that might take place, what that might involve. Does it involve um, coming to visit premises or will it be done remotely initially? Things like that. We would want to try and see if we can put things like that in the contract to actually make sure that you can manage that process. Effectively. Um, now, as part of that review and audit, you will also want to keep records about the um, supply itself. So making sure that you're keeping track really key issues. So if something has been highlighted um, as part of that audit or review as being something that the supplier hasn't been fully achieving um, uh, in terms of any support um, or service levels, or you had any concerns from that last audit about whether or not they are complying with your code of conduct or having relevant processes in place, you can keep a record of that and audit, um, have an audit trail as to whether or not it's an issue that needs to be escalated and um, whether it could be potentially a, um, a breach of contract if things aren't remedied. Um, Glean's already mentioned staff training. I think this is really key because the staff will need to understand how the supplier relationship works, um, what processes and procedures they will be required to comply with um, and also understand the code of conduct and what the focus of that is for the purposes of um, compliance. Um, I would suggest that um, you know you you look at this for definitely the sort of the key managers of the contract but you would also need to ensure that happens at the right level um, for all staff. Other contractual provisions, um, and I'll, I'll just mention three of the other key ones. Um, from an indemnity, from a liability perspective, um, we would often see an indemnity in relation to any losses um, that are caused by an act or omission of a supplier included in a supply contract. The reason for this is that obviously as, as a supplier or even a sort of subcontractor, they're one stage removed from you. So you have a lack of control over that general compliance. Now, if the supplier has done something or not done something that they should have done, and that's caused you a loss as the customer, um, we would normally want to be able to try and recover those losses. Um, and that would normally be done by way of a contractual indemnity. So something to be checking for in the supplier contract. Um, the, um, the other thing that you would want to try and do is have the ability to terminate the agreement if you think that there has been um, a breach by the supplier, because you would want to try and stop that um, non-compliance continuing and causing any further losses or concerns. So those are things those are things, um, uh, concentrating on. Um, one of the other elements that we would normally want to have in the agreement would be a restriction around subcontracting. Um, unless it's done with the customer's approval, or this is looking at it from the customer's perspective. Um, but if the supplier has free will to subcontract to who they want, we wouldn't necessarily have the ability to try and pass on some of the contractual responsibilities that we want the supplier to be complying with and any subcontractor. So you can either um, have a blanket restriction on subcontracting, um, or you can say you, you know any subcontractors would have to be appointed with your approval um, as a customer. So that we can make sure that those relevant provisions are flowed down, including supply code of conduct compliance. Um, one other thing that you might want to check on and potentially have as an obligation under the contract is if the supplier belongs to a particular association, um, uh, sector group or things like that, where they have certain standards um, that need to be complied with, you might also want to ensure that the supplier is contractually bound to achieve those levels of um, standards and excellence. So something to potentially also build into the contract depending on their um, area um, that they're operating in. So once the contract has all been completed and you've got all these things in, what, what happens then? So um, just to um, finish on the next slide, if that's okay, um, Francesca. Um, so as I say, you've, you've done your pre-contractual checks, you're happy from a um, perspective of, um, going through your due diligence that they're the correct party to be um, uh, engaging with. You've got your contractual terms in place with the um, uh, provisions around subcontract termination, management and escalation, but ongoing contract management, you know, this is actually, you know, key because, you know, once it's signed, we don't just want to keep it in the drawer. You know, you actually use that contract as a way to actively manage relationship between customer and supplier because, what we've often done um, with a lot of our um, large corporate clients is actually once a contract signed is you have a key terms sheet at the front of that, which 
pulls out the key points which are important to that relationship. So it could be, you know, what, what's the minimum term? How, what are the um, termination provisions? So how, how can you get out of that? Um, but then what are the other touch points? So how often can you review um, the relationship? How often can you audit? Um, you know, what, what um, frequency does the contract manager, do the contract managers need to meet? Um, anything like that, which gives you sort of touch points with the supplier over the lifetime of the relationship, you know, actually use those to the benefit um, to, to make sure you've got that continued dialogue with a supplier um, so that actually if there are issues, they're easier to, to deal with. Um, and then you can actually, you know, manage those risks. So if there is a risk or an issue that has been brought to the attention of, um, of the contract managers or, or the um, uh, supply um, uh, owner, um, you know, what is the issue and what is the likelihood of a problem occurring? So try and undertake some form of sort of risk analysis on that. So that if there are key risks, these are identifiable to the board um, from a risk register perspective. But actually, is it an issue or a risk that is covered by your insurance as a particular insurable risk? And do you need to notify your insurers of any problems? Um, is it a problem that actually means that you need to potentially bring that relationship to an end um, or is it something that actually you just need to make sure that some changes are put in place so that um, compliance um, is, is not so much of a problem and you can move forward comfortably knowing that it's not going to be um, an issue. Um, now, um, one of the other things that um, is part of that sort of contract relationship side and the audit side of things is as a supplier, you might need to provide um, assistance for reporting obligations on an ongoing basis um, from the modern slavery perspective. So um, that would be something that we would like to try and include as part of the audit provisions in the contract terms. But you know, how often do you need to report from your compliance perspective? And then managing the um, contract moving forward, having having those diarised um, to try and make sure that that's part of your ongoing um, contract management. And I mean, those are just a few points. There's a lot more that we can um, be bringing out. But I think in terms of looking at the contractual parts of the supply chain, those would be the things that I think we would want to try and focus on to um, uh, to, to have that good supply relationship managed. Thank you, Debbie. That, that was really useful and interesting. I've got lots of questions from there and I might hold them to the end. I mean, I think one point that um, was particularly interesting reminded me of something that we looked at. I remember looking at this years ago, which is um, understanding whether suppliers belonging to a particular association. I think that's particularly true of maybe more sustainability. I saw it more in the, in the event sustainability side. I think that's quite an interesting point because if you're signing up to an association having to stand by those commitments, you need to understand how that fits in your overall um, contract management and supplier mm -hmm. management. So so thank you very much. That was very helpful. Um, I hope everyone could hear. I was just having some, some issues with you freezing, Debs, but I'm sure um, we could still hear you. So hopefully it's it's not yeah. on my end. And um, and I'll hand over now, please, to Amelia. Um, so Amelia, if you'd like to introduce yourself and um, I'll pull up your slides too. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Thanks, Coley. So hi, I'm Amelia Woodley. I'm the ESG Director for Speedy Hire. For those that don't know Speedy Hire, we are the UK's largest tool and equipment company providing tools and equipment to the construction and infrastructure sector. Um, I'm also director of Bright Future um, and Bright Future is a modern slavery charity where we support survivors of modern slavery into employment as well. So I'll be speaking about them very briefly through today's webinar. So Colleen, if you wouldn't mind just moving on to the, the next slide. So I thought um, before we get into kind of the detail around modern slavery, I'll just do a really whistle stop tour of our kind of whole approach around sustainability and where modern slavery sits. We've got a sustainability strategy called the Decade to Deliver, which was launched last year. Um, and we called it that because we believe that the next 10 years define the next 100 in terms of what our business looks like, the societies that we create and obviously the planet upon which which we live on. Um, and if you could just move to the next slide, please, Coley. And in that strategy, um, we have four key pillars under the decade to deliver. Our purpose at Speedy is to create a higher revolution, inspiring people to make higher their first choice because hiring tools and equipment is much more sustainable than, than purchasing and consuming. 
And under those four pillars, we have an environmental side, which is around accelerating innovation through all of the equipment that we uh, purchase from our suppliers. So how can we make it more sustainable net zero? How do we as an organization achieve net zero by 2040 or around our climate solutions commitments? And when we look at the social aspects of our strategy, we've got two key pillars. One is about being part of the community. So how do we give back and add social value? And then finally, it's about creating an organization where everybody feels that they're included. And underpinned in our strategy is what we called our being brilliant at the basics. So this is about just doing the right things from a legal and governance perspective. So things we really wouldn't want our customers um, and stakeholders to worry about because we just do it from a day to day. And we use those four pillars to really focus in on those core areas that are important to us. But the reason why I wanted to show you the strategy, not just to kind of position it from our sustainable sustainability vision, but in the development of the decade to deliver, we really thought about the just transition. So how do we uh, transition to a net zero organisation, but do it in a way that's just for society? And if we look at things particularly around our business in terms of purchasing tools and equipment, moving into a battery technology revolution to meet net zero, we've got to look at the modern slavery and human rights impacts of that. So we really look through a dual lens when we approach sustainability within the organisation. So we move to the following slide, please, Colin. So let's get into kind of sort of the nuts and bolts of, of what Speedy's doing around modern slavery and human rights. And I thought it was really important to reflect back onto the kind of the opening questions that Colin raised around the why and the how. So the why for us as an organisation is multifaceted. When we look at modern slavery and human rights, we're looking at all different types of stakeholders within and outside of our organisation. So what are our investors looking for? And we're seeing an increase in investors inquiring into what our modern slavery risk and due diligence in is. And from an investor point of view, you know, ESG risk is financial risk to them. So there's a huge amount of work that we do to discharge those obligations and give our investors comfort that we're managing those issues. We look through a customer lens. So we're seeing an increase in requirements from our customers around modern slavery and human rights particularly any type of project that's government backed. So big infrastructure construction projects, when we're looking at government backed infrastructure and construction, those customers are really asking for us through that bid and tendering process. And then the ongoing contract management, how are we aligned to modern slavery and human rights? How are we managing that risk and discharging those obligations through the supply chain? But we also look at it from a people perspective as well, because most importantly, there is a victim and a survivor at the heart of that. So how do we make decisions that are really important to the people, whether that's the people within the organisation or caught up through employment through the supply chain or that wider community? And that doesn't just have to be a UK based community. That's a global supply chain community as well. So we really want to have a very people focused lens on that. So when we look at modern slavery and human rights, apart from it being the right thing to do, apart from meeting the legal and regulatory requirements, we also look at it through a very risk uh, focused lens. So for us, it's about managing our risk so that we can ensure that we're meeting our obligations, um, not just from a board perspective and a company perspective, but through the supply chain as well. But also, how do we grow revenue? Because not addressing these issues is actually a potential risk to customer to revenue going forward as an organisation, not just for us, but for any businesses at present um, that have to look at these issues through their operations and supply chain. So we really make sure that when we talk about modern slavery and human rights, that we're using the right language with the right stakeholders to get them on board. So that's the why. So in terms of the how, um, we engaged Ardu International last year to come into our business and really sort of do a deep analysis and dive into where we were from modern slavery and human rights compliance perspective and, and also leadership perspective. And we did that voluntarily because we wanted to know where our potential gaps were, where our blind spots were, so that we could ensure, as I mentioned earlier, we're meeting all those stakeholder requirements we're managing that risk, we're growing the revenue and we're doing the right thing by people in that organisation and supply chain. So we had quite a detailed gap analysis and at the time that we did it, we were put in what 
RG would classify as more of a reactive situation. So we're probably reacting to change in legislation and customer requirements and stakeholder requirements as and when they came through. And really what our ambition at Speedy is, is to be more proactive. You know, tipping into that leadership is something, we, you know, we really aspire to do. But we want to be ahead of the game and we really want to kind of know what's going on within that supply chain. So we were assessed against 15 different factors set out by Ardia International. Um, and I'm really pleased to say out of those 15 factors a year later, we've improved on 11 of those with four of them still to do some work. And we've moved from that reactive space into that improving space. And we have a detailed roadmap that takes us into the proactive that um, we've recently had signed off by our PLC board, which represents their commitment to this programme. So, so what did that look like? So as an organisation, we went through a number of changes. So making sure that we were doing proper ESG horizon scanning around what kind of modern slavery, human rights leg legislation and regulation was on the horizon for us. So yes, we were legally compliant with the Modern Slavery Act, but what we wanted to do was go beyond that legal compliance and make sure we knew what was happening out in the industry and out in the supply chain from a legislation and regulation point of view. We've had a complete overhaul of all of our policies. So we've developed a human rights policy. We've updated our anti-slavery human trafficking policies. Um, and we're in the process of updating our supplier code of conduct as well and making sure that modern slavery and human rights is threaded through all of our policies and strategies um, across the organization. Huge amount of work has been undertaken around risk management. So we did a double materiality assessment at Speedy from an ESG perspective. And modern slavery human rights came out of our number four risk. So we spent a lot of time threading modern slavery human rights from our corporate risk register all the way through all of our business specific risk registers so that each senior leader in the business really understands what their roles and responsibilities are for risk management of modern slavery and human rights within the organization and through that supply chain. We've started quite an in-depth piece of work around due diligence. We've not finished, we're on a journey, we've got quite a way to go. And as Colleen says, we are a year in and we still have areas that we need to work through. But what we've done around the due diligence is we've really sort of engaged with the supply chain um, uh, teams and the category managers. We built ESG questions into our onboarding portals to assess where are the suppliers around a maturity perspective. We've written modern slavery and human rights requirements into our supplier agreements, requesting them to give us information around their performance, or what kind of training and education that they've been doing. We've done heightened due diligence on areas of key risk, particularly, as I mentioned uh, earlier, things around investment in eco kits and battery technology, We've used Ardia International to support us on that and do some really in-depth questioning of those suppliers around what their modern slavery and human rights compliance is beyond that statement. So actually taking that modern slavery statement and unpicking the things that they are saying to see are they actively doing the things that they state they are doing from a corporate perspective. And that's been a really interesting process to that. Um, and we've gone through a pro programme of onboarding SEDEX so that we can start to do wider due diligence across our supply chain and understand where those potential risks and opportunities are. So again, as I mentioned, large piece of work that we've been doing, but still quite an area um, to grow within the due diligence framework. A big focus for Speedy was around training. So it's really important, I think, that to ask people to be able to change their behaviours, operate in a different way, it's really important that we make sure that we train people in this emerging legislation and reg regulatory requirements and also just about doing the right thing. So as an organisation, we've delivered modern slavery and human rights training right from the PLC board that was undertaken quite recently through to the executive team, which I sit on, into the senior leadership team as well. We've also um, brought in modern slavery and human rights e-learning modules into our corporate competency framework. So every employee as, it, as of this financial year has been undertaking basic sort of high level modern slavery and human rights training across the business. 
The area we've done some particular focus is around what we call our ESG business partners. So we run a programme um, under our Building Sustainability Confidence programme um, linked to the Green Skills Transition, where we've taken 30 individuals across the organisation and upskilled them to an IEMA associate qualification. That includes people in HR, so when they're looking at recruitment, when they're looking at rights to work checks, it includes people in category management, it includes people in supply chain. Um, and we've trained them up through our GR on modern slavery and human rights, but most in particularly important to us was making sure that actually we gave a voice to that survivor. Because it's really hard, I think, when you sit in an organisation to kind of sit there and think that issue is far removed, it's on the other side of the world, it doesn't affect me. But every decision that we make, particularly around our supply chain selection, ties into our ESG risks and opportunities. And what the work we did with the uh, um, modern slavery survivor was to really kind of bring home these issues to the organisation that this does happen. So we've had talks from um, survivors that have been trafficked across Europe. So they've been either trafficked through financial means or for sexual means. We've had people that have been caught up in modern slavery in construction sites as cleaners. So it really tried to open that lens that it is actually around us and that we all have a duty and moral obligation to make sure that we're doing the right thing as a business within our operations and our supply chain. We also really upped all our monitoring and reporting because we don't really know how we're performing if we're not really looking at the data and being really transparent about what we're doing. So we've spent several years, I think a total of two now, refining our modern slavery statement with the support from RDR, being really transparent about what we're doing as an organisation and ensuring that we can meet those obligations that we're stating that we are going to achieve. We've put in over time KPIs each year, you know, KPIs around training. We've introduced KPIs around policy. We've started now this financial year to introduce KPIs around supply chain. So how many of our suppliers are signed up to our agreement and actually um, complying with those agreements? How many of our suppliers are undertaking due diligence? So we're really starting to get into that detail to ensure that we have that maturity in the supply chain which we expect. And last but not least, and I left this to the end because I think it's really easy to sort of start with the leadership element. You know, you get someone to sponsor it and it all comes together. But really, that's really the smallest part. So as an organisation, you know, we're committed to modern slavery and human rights right up to the PLC board. Um, I sit on the executive team. I'm the executive sponsor for modern slavery and human rights for the business. So I'll take ownership of all of those programmes and work with all those stakeholders internally. We also restructured our whole governance programme, so making sure we had a clear line of sight right up from the business operations, particularly linked into our supply chain functions, into our ESG committee that I chair, right up to our PLC sustainability committee, which is chaired by our NEDs. So there's full kind of leadership and governance control of, of these issues. So a huge amount of work been really interesting and it's been really great to see the progress. And, and what I wanted to share with you were kind of two things. One is our programme is being completely human centric, which is why we've got victim and survivor right into the middle of that diagram, because every decision and every conversation we're having, we're always making sure that we're thinking about that victim and survivor in 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 that whole due diligence process because really that's the most important thing and it really tries to focus those people back to those important issues we've partnered with bright future um, as i mentioned i'm a director of to support modern slavery survivors into the construction sector and we've done a lot of work around bringing other construction bodies into that partnership to open up these opportunities because the vision at Bright Future is everybody has a right to live with dignity and pride. And we take that philosophy very seriously at Speedy. So it's really important that we think about the human centric element. But interestingly, when we went through this process, we started initially around where are our blind spots, making sure that we've got um, a good position from a legal and regulatory perspective. But what this journey has done is unlock business revenue. So we've seen that we've behaved, we've performed better in tenders. Um, we've seen that we've won work. 
not solely off the back of this program, but what this program has done is been able to kind of create a more mature ESG position. So when a customer is looking at us, particularly from an ESG perspective, they can see that, you know, we're mature in the E, the S and the G. And the Modern Slavery and Human Rights Program really fits across that SNG pillar. So it really has enabled us to reduce our risk and grow our revenue as a business, which is really important when you're talking to boards, particularly PLC, around the importance of modern slavery and human rights within their organisation. So that's a wrap for me, and I hope you found that interesting and happy to take any questions on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amelia. Um, I think what, what you have um, shared is, is perhaps something that is not spoken about enough when we look at how businesses are tackling modern slavery as a, as a really key element, where many businesses to see the development of a statement as something they have to do annually. It's a cut and paste job sometimes. It just goes through a similar process. But but what you've really shared, which, you know, I mean, I know we've worked with you and, um, you know, shared in a lot of, um some of i guess the challenges and some of the um and the wins that kind of thing is that you're bringing such a human centric view to this and i don't think we see that i um, see debbie's nodding too i don't think we we see that very often and and you know i hope that for people who are listening to this that they will take that as an inspiration because it is actually what is required when you are considering human rights impacts is understanding how you impact on people. And this, in this case, it's talking about survivors of modern slavery because that's actually, as a subject matter, we are addressing that specifically and it relates to a specific piece of law. So I think, you know, that's one element that, I, that you know, thank you for sharing that because I think we need to hear that more often. I think the second point really is also the um the uh, the insights you've brought around the revenue growth you know for so many organizations there is a sticking point on how to find resource to do this kind of work and they leave it because they think it's too expensive they don't they don't see the benefit of it but actually if you and others start being able to evidence that kind of change in revenue flow in appropriate risk management, I'm sure that that's going to have a really positive effect in industry, not just in construction, but across the board. And I'm just wondering, you know, actually, um, if we if we think about that, moving that dial a little bit more, what do you think were perhaps two or three critical factors that moved you as a business from that reactive bucket to that improving bucket? Um, so I think I think the two or three factors, Colleen, were, um, you know, our, our obligation, you know, businesses are here to grow and be profitable. Um, and there and there's there's no reason why they can't do it in an ethical and sustainable way. So when we started to see the requirements come through from the customer perspective in, in the sense of there were much more detailed questions coming through, there was a much more enhanced level of evidence that needed to be provided. And, and even following that through into contract management around modern slavery and human rights audit. So if we think back five years, it probably would have been a question that you could probably could have submitted a policy or statement to and attached it. Um, and, and the client maybe wouldn't have circled back on that. What we've seen is the client asking more, wanting more evidence and circling back on that. So it was really important that we, we moved the dial and made sure that we were able to answer the questions and we had the evidence and that it lived and breathed on a day to day basis. It wasn't an exercise that was done for a bidding activity and stopped. It was it was ongoing just as part of good business management. So it was it was the customer requirements that moved the dial. It was the increase in regulation that was coming in and increasing interest from investors as well. So we were seeing lots more questions around modern slavery and human rights. 
we were seeing lots more uh, movement in the supply chain around increasing due diligence and you know we've got csrd around the corner um so we were starting to see that that those questions were coming through thick and fast and we've just done another investor disclosure recently and the modern slave and human rights question set has increased again for a second year in a row so when you put those two things together and you want to engage a board um, to move from a place of we have a statement, we've got we've ticked the legal box to creating a position where you are threading it through a business and supply chain and it's living and breathing as the organisation. Those were the two things that I took to the PLC board and said, you know, we, we legally comply and we're doing the right thing, but we need to do more if we want to reduce our risk and grow our revenue. So we can stay as we are, and it's not a problem. Um, but if we want to do those two things, we have to go above and beyond legal compliance because legal compliance is not enough anymore. Um, and that's the way that we got that engagement because otherwise, as you said earlier, people focus on the legislation, they focus on policy and governance, they're not focusing on kind of, you know, what's the impact to the business if I don't do that? And, you know, when we couple in things like brand reputation, huge risk to an organisation if something went wrong. So we have to make sure that we have no blind spots um, and, we, and we are as transparent as we realistically can be. Um, and that's the thing that shifted the discussion that moved us from a place of, you know, being legally compliant and having a statement to running a whole program for a year where we've 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 um, moved across 11 or 15 factors. Thank you, Amelia. That's really helpful. And um, we've just got a minute and I, I wonder, Debs, if you um, perhaps want to just very briefly. I, actually, it's a different question to perhaps you anticipating for me, but I was just wondering whether you are seeing an increase in interest in having your the contracts amended to address <laughs> things like modern slavery and forced labor and you know building in more appropriate escalation clauses mm, yeah and, and i think it's one of those key areas where as part of general esg considerations it's it's actually being um um sort of brought to the um table a lot more quickly so I mean from the escalation process side of things we would um, always recommend having something in the contract which allows for that to um, take place in a in a clear way so that everyone knows how those discussions would take place but also if it needs to be brought to the um, board for discussion like you were saying Amelia you know it's some of these things are sort of needing to be brought to the board to make sure that they're being dealt with correctly because otherwise we, we don't necessarily understand what the impact would be um, of risks to the business you know do we need to consider other um, impacts as well such as um, suspension of of services if there's if there's a concern of, of modern slavery compliance um, and how that would actually be dealt with so you know, if, for example, you've already you, you're um, replying to a public tender, you know, a lot of those processes and procedures are already built into that type of thing. But where it's um, supply contracts, where it's not off the back of that and it's between two commercial entities, we are seeing um, sometimes quite long and lengthy clauses uh, going in around modern slavery compliance and things like that as well. Yeah. Thank you, Debbie. Well, we've actually reached um, a minute after our allocated time. So I just want to say again, thank you so much for all of you who attended. Special thanks to Amelia and Debbie for your time and your insights. Um, I just want to finish off by saying Audia is hosting a conference on the 7th of November on modern slavery, which DMH Stallard is going to is partnering with us on. So it's at their offices in London. Um, both Debbie and Amelia will be speaking. So you can come and hear some more about these subjects and meet 
both Amelia and Debbie. So I've put the link into the chat. We've got a few tickets left, so it would be fabulous if you could sign up and join us. And so really just again to say thank you to everyone who's listened, dialed in today, and special thanks to Amelia and Debbie and to Francesca supporting. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone.